sermon title today. You ready for this one? It's the end of the beginning. Just think about it, okay? And maybe it'll make sense when we're all done, and you're like, well, I just wish you'd get to the end, right? So here's the thing. It does have a lot to do with Christmas. Number one, it's the story that we're going to be looking at is all about our Lord, of course. But even more than that, you know, the Word of God is all about Him. Every book of the Bible is about our Lord. He said that himself. And so um, anytime we come together to celebrate, to, to look at his word and to fellowship together in the name of Christ, you know, that is a beautiful time. You know, Christmas is every day for us as believers because Christmas is about celebrating Emmanuel, God with us, the one who came down from heaven off his throne and walked among us to live a perfect life and to die for each one of us. And so as we dive into this book, that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, the book of Ruth, I will do a bit of a review today, and uh, hopefully it won't take too long. <laughs> you know how that is. But um, I do want to cover it. I want to cover this in review because, as I've said a few times, there's more going on here in the book of Ruth than just, if you read the plain text, it's a wonderful story, but there's more going on here. And I told you, it really, it reveals something special. The book of Ruth reveals the heart of God. The heart of God is on display in many of the books of the Bible, no doubt, but more so in Ruth than just about any other. And it was a beautiful mystery. The Old Testament, you know, Israel, they couldn't fully understand the book of Ruth. It's only in the light of the New Testament with the power of the Holy Spirit and knowing everything that's come to pass that we're able to understand the book of Ruth in a deeper way. And I told you there were at least three layers that we were going to look at as we studied out this book of Ruth. Three layers. The first layer is just that, the story of Ruth and Boaz and Naomi and all of this. There are many lessons, human lessons and all of that. There are many lessons at that first layer. But then there's that second layer, the prophetic promise to the church. There's a beautiful thing going on in the book of Ruth that is so special because we're seeing our kinsman redeemer. We're seeing redemption. But then also the third layer I wanted you to pay attention to was the personal layer because it's your story. God loves you so much that he came to this planet to redeem you personally. He wants a relationship with you personally. And that's what this book declares. It's such a powerful and beautiful book. We see God's heart to redeem each of us. But he also has a desire for a relationship with each one of us. You must have a relationship. And we've seen that in this book. We've seen, though, this beautiful thing where Ruth, this Gentile widow with no hope for redemption... But through the light of Israel, through the light of the house of David, we know this. Our Messiah came forth, and it's a picture. Ruth is a picture of the church, and all of this is a picture of our redemption. It's a beautiful thing. And we know that Israel was to point the Gentiles to the way of salvation, to the way of redemption. And in the book of Ruth, we've seen how Naomi is a picture and type of the Jewish nation, a woman who is Jewish from the tribe of Judah, and she leads, directs, and instructs Ruth to the kinsman, to Boaz. She's the one who lit her path to the house of Boaz, to this place of the kinsman redeemer. And all along the way, as we've studied out this wonderful love story between a man and a woman, we've seen much, much more. We've seen God's word displayed in a way that's powerful and true. This beautiful mystery of the church in the Old Testament. Remember, we were a mystery, a beautiful mystery. <laughs> and if you can't think of yourself as beautiful, it's okay, because the Lord sees you as beautiful. No matter how you feel today, the Lord sees you as beautiful, church. But I told you that the only way you're able to see all of this in this book is if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. And on that note, before we dive in any further, let's pray. Father God, this is your word. And God, you say you esteem your word above your name and that your word will do what it's called to do. And so God, let your word go deep into our hearts today as we come before you on this day celebrating the birth of our Lord. Let your word Give birth in our hearts, Lord, to something brand new. Lord, fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Help us to see. Give us eyes to see in your scripture. Give us ears to hear and change us from the inside out. We praise you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. And so today we're going to see the culmination of all of this in the book of Ruth. We know that Naomi, she was widowed. She was a widow and she had lost her sons. She was all alone in the world in a foreign land with seemingly no hope. That was Naomi's story. And if it would have ended there, it would have been tragic. But we know it didn't end there. Ruth, this Moabite woman, this Gentile woman, had become a true believer in the one true God. 
And we saw that, but she also loved Naomi. She decided that she was going to travel back to Bethlehem to not allow Naomi to go home alone, and she wasn't going to stay in her foreign country or in her own land. She was going to go to a foreign land with Naomi because she loved her that much. Because remember this, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, remember what his name means? It means, my God is king. But Elimelech certainly did not believe God was his king or he would have stayed in Israel. During that time of famine, without bread, without sustenance, Elimelech decided he was going to go to the land of Moab, to the enemies of Israel for his provision. And it didn't end well, did it? We know Elimelech, when he got there, he died early on in Moab. And then the two sons would die about 10 years later. It was tragic. And this left Naomi literally alone because even her, her daughters-in-law were no longer her daughters-in-law because the sons had died. Orpah and Ruth, remember? And Naomi, she begged them. She said, just stay here in Moab. I'm going home. I'm going home broken without hope in bitterness. I'm going home. You just stay here. You worship your foreign gods. You worship these gods of Moab. You find husbands in Moab. Just stay here. And we know Orpah stayed, but Ruth did not stay. And I told you Ruth doesn't say a lot in the book, in her, the book titled after her name, but when she does, it's so beautiful. But something that we looked at in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we saw Ruth's words to Naomi. And I told you it's beautiful, and often it's quoted at weddings. But understand this, it's also prophecy. Do you realize she's prophesying? And all of it would come to pass. Look at what she said in verse 16 and 17 in chapter 1. This is what Ruth said to Naomi. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried or will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. Everything in that statement came true. Ruth, Naomi's family became Ruth's family. Naomi's God, the God of Israel, the one true God, became Ruth's God. Ruth would die in that land, so would Naomi. It all came true. It's a beautiful prophecy. Ruth was a woman who had found faith in the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And she had found a new mother in the faith. She found a mother whom she was willing to, to follow because she loved dearly. And so Ruth journeyed back to Israel, back to Bethlehem with Naomi. And remember, Naomi, when she returned, she didn't want the ladies of Bethlehem calling her Naomi, which means sweet or pleasant. She wanted to be known as Mara, which means bitter. She went from sweet to bitter. But this, just listen to me. <laughs> this right here will happen to any of us. Any of us who look after, who go after the things of the world, who go after the things of the enemy, and we forget the things of God. It will happen to any one of us. And it doesn't just mean in some big backsliding way. Do you understand? Whenever there's a sin in your life where you have rebellion, where you run away from God, like Elimelech and Naomi, like this family did, when you run away from God and you look for the enemy's sustenance or you just re refuse to hear God, bitterness will come into your life. It doesn't have to be, again, it doesn't have to be this big backsliding moment. It might be your pride. It might be gossip. It might be hatred or anger or bitterness. All of these things, bitterness itself is a sin, deep sin. But every sin that we hold on to and we refuse to give to God, that we run from God, in that area, I promise you, bitterness will form. But God loves you enough not to keep you bitter. Do you know when you're a child of the king, he loves you enough? He loved Naomi enough not to keep her bitter. Naomi wouldn't stay bitter. He wouldn't allow her to wallow in her bitterness. And we read there in chapter 2 that she gets a glimmer of hope. In chapter 2, we read early on of this man named Boaz, a wealthy man of high character. And remember, Ruth just happened to be gleaning his field. And Reboaz just happened to show up. I talked about all of God's divine providence. His hand is always working in the natural. Even today, among all of your distractions and the holiday and everything that's going on, God is working in your life in ways you can't understand. And imagine when we get to heaven and we get to see that full layout of how many, God, how many times uh, God intervened in your life in the most littlest, smallest whispers and ways. We have no idea how much he loves us. 
But here's the thing. God had injected a glimmer of hope. And remember, the laws of Israel allowed people of Israel, the poor, the needy, the fatherless, the widows, to glean the fields of the rich. The rich were to give the corners of their field to glean. And remember, it was good for both parties. It was good for the poor because it gave them dignity. They could work for their food. And it worked for the rich because it helped them be generous and giving. It's this beautiful system. And remember, Naomi went there to pick up the scraps to glean, or I'm sorry, Ruth, because she was faithful. And she went there for her and Naomi both to get them food. And remember, Boaz gave her favor. And he said, don't glean in any other field. Just glean this field. And he also gave her water to drink, which was for his servants, not for the gleaners. And that was a beautiful picture of our Lord who gives us water to drink. And if you drink the water of the Lord, you will never thirst again. And one thing, you know, I've been talking to several people in the last few weeks. And it always comes down to the same thing. Jesus has to be enough. When Jesus isn't enough in your life is when you start to, you know, uh, when you start to fight and wrestle with God. When Jesus isn't enough, then you have to look at all these other external things to please you and to satisfy you. When Jesus isn't enough, church will never be enough. The Bible will never be enough. The next move of God will never be enough. Jesus has to be enough. You have to love Jesus more than any sin you're holding on to. You have to. And know this, he alone satisfies. When Jesus is enough and you drink from that well, you will be content. You will be satisfied. You will stop making people around you miserable. <laughs> I only speak from experience because that's my testimony. One day, it just hit me. He is truly enough. He's enough. What else is there, friends? Jesus is enough. But he also gave her, remember this, he gave her protection and provision in his field. He told her to stay there and she'd be protected and provided for. And remember, Ruth was overwhelmed with this because she didn't understand why this stranger, this man she didn't know, would give her such favor. And that word for favor is the same word of grace. It's grace. It's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor which is such a beautiful picture of our Lord. He has given you and I so much grace. We don't deserve it. We deserve hell. We deserve hell. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? We deserve hell. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. He gave us mercy. We're not going to hell, but grace is getting what we don't deserve. Unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor, and we are getting all of that and more. The Lord is so sufficient. He is all we need, and he has a perfect plan for your life. And not only that, he has an excellent plan for your eternal life. He's enough. But remember this. We see the heart of Ruth in all of this because, remember, Boaz feeds her. And Ruth holds back some of the food to take home to Naomi. And then he sends her home with all of this extra grain. And Boaz, this picture, this beautiful picture and type of Christ in this book, we found out that he was qualified as what is called a kinsman redeemer, the goel in Hebrew. The goel is a powerful word. Remember, it means redeemed. It's a beautiful word. But Ruth didn't understand this. She didn't understand all the traditions of Israel, but Naomi did. Naomi understood this. She knew the customs and laws of Israel. Again, she is a picture of the Jewish people. She knew all of this. And so Naomi explained all of this to Ruth, that Boaz was a kinsman redeemer. And if you remember in chapter 3, I told you that the kinsman redeemer in Israel had four areas where he was supposed to, under the law, redeem the family. Four areas. Number one, he could redeem the slave. Anybody in the family who was sold into slavery could be redeemed, could be bought. The ransom could be paid to redeem that family member out of slavery. He was also the one, if a, if a piece of land was lost during a hard time when a family had to sell it, he could redeem that land. We know also he was the one who was the avenger of blood. He could redeem the murder of a family member. But then also he could continue the family line. He was supposed to continue the family line for a family member who had died. And in all four of those elements, we see a beautiful picture of our kinsman, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, because he bought you and me out of slavery. We were enslaved to our sin. We had no hope. We had no future. It was utter bitterness for us. 
But he bought us. He paid our price. He paid the ransom on the cross of Calvary. And not only that, we saw that he, even though the redemption ultimately is its future, we see that in the book of Revelation in chapter 5, he redeemed the land that was lost by our relative, the world, the earth, and Israel, all of it. But not only that, he's the avenger of blood. He is going to judge the one who came to kill, steal, and destroy. And that's coming as well. And lastly, we know this. He has raised up a family, a family of God to continue the family. And we saw that Naomi began to have hope in all of this. She instructed Ruth on how to ask Boaz for a covering, how to go to him, how to ask for him to become a kinsman redeemer to redeem her. And Naomi, again, a picture and type of the, uh, the Jewish nation. She's also a picture and type of the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. Remember, it was to light the way for the Gentiles. And in this way, she instructed Ruth, this Gentile woman, how to receive redemption, how to ensure her future. She instructs Ruth on how to do this. She points her to Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, and she shows her that she must request a relationship. It's not just this cold thing. This is such a beautiful picture for you and me because I told you many in that day will come, the scripture says, and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you, you worker of iniquity, because there was no relationship. He's going to say, I never knew you. And so Naomi points Ruth to the covering of the kinsmen, but also to relationship, to redemption, but relationship. And I talked about, again, that word redeem, goel, it's the word for kinsman. It means redemption or redeem or to be redeemed. It's used 23 times in the book of Ruth and 13 times alone in chapter 4. And again, you want to know the heart of God? This whole book declares the heart of God. The heart of God is redemption. He wants to redeem a lost people. That is what his plan is surrounded. That is what he's done since the beginning of time. The lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. The lamb that would come as a little baby. Emmanuel, it's a beautiful thing, but it's used 23 times, this word redeemed. And if you think about the book of Ruth, just look at this. It's not just any story. It's the story of a Gentile bride rescued by a Jewish redeemer to raise up a family in the line of a Jewish woman named Naomi. Do you see any parallels here? To graft them in, so to speak. And so we saw in chapter 3 the picture of our relationship. Our kinsman, he desires a relationship with us. We must come to him, lay at his feet, ask for his covering, and we must be those who are willing to get to know him, to have a relationship with him, to, requ to request not only redemption, but relationship. And Ruth did this all according to what Naomi had instructed, and we saw at the end of chapter 3 that Ruth had to simply sit still and wait for the kinsman to do his work. She had to wait on the kinsman redeemer. He had to do work and remember what had to be done because we learned there was another, a closer relative, another kinsman. But just like our nearest relative, Adam, the nearer relative to Naomi could not redeem Ruth because he was not willing. Therefore, he did not qualify. And in Ruth chapter 4, in the first 10 verses, two weeks ago we saw this. We saw Boaz, he went to the city gates to ask for the right of redemption and when the closer relative failed to redeem, because he wasn't willing or able, Boaz declared publicly and legally that he would redeem Ruth, that he would redeem this Gentile bride. He did this for Ruth, an outsider. She was an outsider, a Moabite woman. She was not able to redeem herself, and so Boaz did this for her. And so not only did he qualify, but he was willing and able to redeem the Gentile bride publicly and legally. And in this, I told you that this, we see another beautiful picture of our Lord who publicly and willingly went to the cross of Calvary, who walked up the hill of Golgotha in front of all the masses, in front of all the people recorded in history forever. He did it publicly and legally under the law, and he paid our price, and he redeemed us. And it's a beautiful picture. And we saw, though, Boaz at the gates of the city last time. Remember, he had... He had reconciled this with the other kinsman, the nearer relative, who could not redeem. He had declared he would be the redeemer, and this is what he said about Ruth. Verse 10 in chapter 4, Moreover, Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malhan, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. 
And I just want us to think about this because all the way back in chapter 1, I told you, chapter 1, Naomi is not the same woman in chapter 4. In chapter 1, she was bitter and all hope seemed lost. But don't lose the fact that Ruth also had all hope lost. Do you understand what Ruth was doing? When, when Ruth decided to return with Naomi and be loyal to her, she was giving up on a future of her own. She was giving up on ever having a family. She was returning with a widow who had no sons. There was no provision. And so she was giving all that up to return with Naomi to a foreign land, a place she knew nothing about, where Moabite women were looked down on so much. She was going to be an extreme outsider, and I don't know if you've ever felt that way. But you know what? The Lord loves you. He loves the outcasts and the outsiders. That's his heart. We're going to see that in this beautiful genealogy of Jesus. All the outcasts, they're just like you and me. But she was an extreme outcast, and obviously no good Jewish mother would allow her son to marry a Moabite. They were a cursed race, remember that. Cursed for ten generations, and Ruth just happened to be in the eleventh, just happened to be in the eleventh. But I spoke about God's divine hand of providence and had been working the entire time. And we're now seeing the result of this because it all changed in a single day. In one moment, God can do things in one moment, in one day, things we can't even fully understand. Don't give up hope. Keep praying. Keep seeking the Lord. He can change your situation in one single day. In one single moment, and we saw that. In one moment, hope had arrived. Hope for Naomi's family to be extended and redeemed. Hope for Ruth to have a husband who loved her, a husband who would redeem her, a husband who would protect her and provide for her, one who would give her hope and a future and raise up a family with her. And that would have been a great place to end the book of Ruth. Happy, happy ending, right? It's beautiful, but God didn't end the book there. We see everything has come full circle, but God didn't end the story right here. He had more to tell us, and really it's a beginning. In verse 11, look at this. We read the response of the witnesses at the gate, Ruth 4.11. And all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. And may you prosper in Ephrathah, Ephrath, easy for me to say, and be famous in Bethlehem. See, these men are happy for Boaz. He's in his mid to late 40s. He's probably never been married. He's all alone and he's a man of high character. He's well liked. He's kind, he's considerate, he loves the Lord. And so no doubt they're happy for Boaz, their friend, who finally has a wife to continue the line. Not only Naomi's family, but his own. And so no doubt they're happy. And they say, the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and may you prosper in Ephrathah and be famous in, in Bethlehem. And we know the story of Rachel and Leah. If you don't know that story, I'll summarize quickly. Remember Jacob, who became Israel. He really loved this woman, Rachel, the, the daughter of Laban. And Laban was kind of a stinker, wasn't he? But so was Jacob. And God was teaching Jacob a lesson. So he said, you serve seven years and I'll let you have my daughter, Rachel. Oh, he loved Rachel. She was beautiful. Leah, the other daughter, the oldest daughter, she was not so beautiful. The Bible said she had weak eyes. Well, when you look at that in Hebrew, she wasn't a looker. Let's just say that. <laughs> So, so here's the thing. I'll be kind, all right? So here's the thing. So Jacob, he serves for seven years happily. Oh, I love Rachel. I'm going to serve. I'm going to get her. So on the wedding night, what does Laban do? Of course, she's veiled. He marries her, and voila, it's Leah, the oldest. And he says, hey, I'll make you a deal. I'll make you a deal. Work another seven years, and then I'll give you Rachel. Because in customs, in our customs, we have to marry off the oldest first. And so Jacob, the heel catcher, right? This guy who's a swindler and a stinker himself, he's learning a lesson. He's being treated like he treats others. This is another lesson for all of us. The law of sowing and reaping. Have you ever wondered why God keeps putting those people in your life? You know those people. You know what I'm talking about. That person in your life that keeps teaching you a lesson that you refuse to learn because you've sown so much of that in your own life. And God brings those type of people into your life to teach you a lesson. Because make no doubt, that's what's going on here. Jacob was learning valuable lessons from Laban. He was learning not to be 
like Laban, not to be like himself. God was teaching him. And know this, if you want to reap a new harvest, start, start sowing new seed today. Sow a new seed in your life, in the lives of others. And you'll reap that harvest. Sow love and forgiveness and kindness and watch what happens. Don't be like Jacob. But here's the thing, we know that these two women would be the foundation of Israel. Jacob would have many children through mostly Leah, but then eventually even through Rachel. Remember, she would have Joseph, and then she would die in childbirth with Benjamin. But this is what the blessing was. In ancient Israel, they would always say, may your house be like that of Jacob and Leah and Rachel, the foundational family of Israel. May your house be foundational. That's what these men are saying. And I just want you to understand, this is also prophetic. This is also a prophecy. Because what they said came true as well. The blessing came true. This family would become foundational in the birth of who? Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. This family would be foundational. And not only that, it would happen in the very city, the very town they were in, their town, Bethlehem. But these men, they add a blessing in verse 12. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. Now, <laughs> there's some lessons in the story of Tamar as well. And I won't go too much into that um, on Christmas. The Bible has a lot of stuff in it. <laughs> you know, it has some stories. But remember what Tamar, what happened to her. Tamar, there were a lot of ugly details in her story, but I just want to say this. You know, some of us in this room, many of us in this room, maybe we have some ugly details in our past. Things we still wrestle with and contend with. Turn them over to the Lord. Don't let the enemy have his way. Turn them over to the Lord and he'll use those things in a beautiful way. God's not afraid of your past. No matter what you've gone through, no matter how ugly it's been, just turn it over to the Lord and live for him. He loves you that much. As we're looking at all of this, we're going to see the genealogy of Jesus has some things in it, has some people in it, just like you and me. He didn't, he didn't run from that. The Lord embraces that. Today, if you've been through things and your past is, is checkered and questionable, give it to the Lord. Whatever you're wrestling with, anything that still haunts you, give it to him. Cast your cares upon the Lord, not with a fishing pole because you reel it back in. Give it to him completely. But Tamar, she has this kind of ugly story, but we know what happened with her. Tamar was to give birth to Perez. He was one of the twins, but know this. He became the father of the Bethlehemites and the Frathites. He was the most famous and influential patriarch of that time, one of the most powerful within the tribe of Judah. But when you read the story of Genesis 38, it's quite a story. Tamar was denied a kinsman. Remember, her husband was so wicked and evil that God killed him. Literally, God killed him because he was wicked and evil. There's another lesson, okay? Just <laughs> go read that out. But then his brother did something wicked. He used Tamar, but he refused to be a kinsman redeemer. He refused, and so what did God do? He killed him too. And then Tamar, two wrongs don't make a right. You've heard that, right? Tamar decided she was going to take matters into her own hands, and she was going to make it happen. And she fooled Judah by acting, playing the harlot. Go read the story. But she conceived twins. And then this remarkable thing happened with Perez and his brother, these twins. The brother, his arm came out first <laughs> when he was going to be born. He was going to be firstborn. And they would do this thing in Israel. I won't go into all this because there's many pictures and types in all of this, trust me. But his arm came out and the maidservant, she tied a scarlet thread around his wrist. But then Perez, this little sucker, <laughs> he somehow breached the gap. It's literally what his name means. He pushed his brother back and he came out first. Unlikely circumstances, an unlikely birth, but he became powerful. And that's the blessing they're throwing out because no doubt they recognize all of the circumstances, these unlikely circumstances in Ruth and Boaz in their union. But may you have family like Perez, strong, stable, and steady, one who is a patriarch in all of Israel, in Bethlehem. And again, the prophecy came true. That's exactly what happened because we know this. We have the luxury of history, and we know this blessing came to pass because we know through this family would come the strongest of all, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Not only that, of the same line that we're talking about, Perez and, and the son of Ruth, and as we'll see, and Boaz, the greatest kings of Israel, 
David and Solomon. Do you understand? God can use anyone in any circumstance, no matter your past, no matter where you're at in life, he can use you mightily. He just wants those who are willing. We then see that Boaz takes Ruth and they are married. Look at verse 13 and 14. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. We could sit there a long time because what that points to for you and me. I long for the day and I look forward to the day and I know you do too. When our Lord comes, when the bridegroom comes at the midnight hour, when he sounds the trumpet and he says, bride, let's go home. Let's go to the wedding ceremony and celebrate the wedding feast in my father's home. It won't be long now, folks. And I've told you before, even if the rapture doesn't happen soon, one day all of us will have a personal rapture. And today, it's not, I don't think it's a crime to really think about that. On the day we celebrate the birth of our Lord, it's okay to think about one day all of us will have our own personal rapture. If we're not taken in the rapture, every single one of us will pass and we will stand before the Lord. Wouldn't you rather show up as part of the family? I don't know. If you're here today and you're struggling, you're living away from God, or you've never received Christ, ponder these things. Because he loves you enough that he came and walked among us and died for you and me. Just think about these things. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. This is so beautiful. Boaz and Ruth are married, and they have this son. But I love this because did you notice that blessing of these women? It's not directed towards Ruth. Who's it directed towards? Naomi. Do you understand? Chapter 1, Naomi was all about bitterness. <laughs> but this blessing is now covering Naomi. Look at this. It's beautiful. This blessing is directed at Naomi because God has given her a new family. God has taken away her bitterness. In chapter 1, she was Mara. She wanted to be known as Mara. But now she's Naomi again. She's pleasant and sweet. She's been blessed because through her family, although it was cut off, although she was cut off, she thought her future was done. She thought she had no hope. God had simply just pushed a pause button on her life. And God was now giving her a brand new family grafted into the old. And don't miss this because it is important. I've talked about this quite a bit in the last couple months, especially with the war in Israel and all these things going on. I told you, you don't have to support the, the government and the politics of Israel. That's not what we're talking about. But understand that God is not done with Israel. He is not done with the line of Naomi. He is not done with her. Understand he pushed a pause button to do what? And even though all hope is lost, it seems lost in Israel, it's not lost. God has a plan. In Romans 11, verse 1 and 2, Paul tells us this, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I, am, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. God is not done with Israel, just as he wasn't done with Naomi. But he had another plan. And what was that plan? Just like Naomi, to graft in a new family. And we see this because Paul goes on to give Gentile believers a warning and take this warning to heart. In verses 16, 17, and 18, look at this in Romans 11. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree, <laughs> that's, there's a nickname for you, Gentile church, you wild olive tree, you were grafted in among them. And with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. That's what Paul is telling. And you know what? He goes on to say something really powerful in verses 25 through 27. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away 
their sins. God is not done with Israel, just as he was not done with Naomi. God warns all of us, no matter how it might look right now, God is not done with Israel. He will complete his promise. He will finish what he has started. And just like Naomi, even though we know, they now rest in bitterness. Just like Naomi, remember, she was in bitterness. She thought all hope was lost, and she had been isolated, and she returned to the land of Israel during a time of a bitter condition, right after a season of what? Famine and death. Do you see the parallels? Think about this for a second. Israel has returned to the land just as Ezekiel prophesied, but she would return in unbelief, in bitterness, just like Naomi did. And she is there today. Israel is there today. God is not done with her. He is not done. Even though all hope seems lost, it is not lost. We know that they would return in a single day. Isaiah 66 says that they would return in a single day. And we know May 14, 1948, they returned in a single day. And it's such a blessing because all hope is not lost. But then we see the women of Bethlehem, they add this blessing in verse 15. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. That is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. That's how much... Ruth loved Naomi. We see this wonderful picture. We see this daughter of Naomi, who was once not her daughter, but now is her daughter. She's in the family of Naomi. She's brought back into the family through the marriage of the kinsman redeemer, through Boaz here in chapter 4. But we see something even bigger here. Again, don't miss this. We see that Ruth loved Naomi. She was loyal to Naomi. She was better than seven sons. She's faithful and true. We see this daughter who has been grafted in, who loves her dearly, loves Naomi, loves her so much that she is faithful no matter what. And yet how many in the church, unlike Ruth, look at Israel in disdain? How many say, oh, she's cursed. God's done with her. How many of these hold on to replacement theology, which is from Satan himself? How many spit on Israel? Again, you don't have to support the government and the politics of Israel, but the land of Israel is God's, and he gave it to the nation Israel, and he has a purpose and a plan, and the Bible declares that he will bless those who bless her and curse those who curse her, and yet we have people who call themselves part of the family of God, cursing the root, cursing the branches, cursing Naomi. We need to be like Ruth and be faithful and love her and realize God is not done with her. And when Jesus returns, you've heard me say it, where do you think he's returning to? The throne of David, the nation of Israel, the city of Jerusalem. But notice this, this blessing these women speak. It says, may this child be a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. That's who this child is to be. And just think about it today as we celebrate the birth of the child, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. Isn't he the one who came to restore life? It's a beautiful picture, but know this. He will also redeem Israel. He will finish his ancient promise. In her old age, just as it says here, Jesus is going to redeem Israel in her old age, at the end of days. And I can't help but read Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, verses 4 through 8, is not only you get a hint of Naomi's story with part of Ruth, but you also get Israel's story. Look at this. Do not fear. This is God saying this declaration to Israel. For you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced. For you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name and your redeemer. That word redeemer is Goel. Who is the redeemer of Israel? Who is the kinsman redeemer? He is the holy one of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit like a youthful wife. When you were refused, says your God, for a mere moment I have forsaken you. But with great mercies, I will gather you. With a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your kinsman redeemer. Same word, Goel. This is so beautiful because this is Naomi's story. And this is Israel's story. Do you have eyes to see? I love the scripture. 
But I also love how this finishes up, how the book of Ruth finishes up in verses 16 through 22, because it finishes with this beautiful and wonderful and crazy genealogy. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. Obed means servant. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz. And Boaz begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse begot David. Look at what God can do in the most unlikely circumstance with people who, let's face it, outcasts. People like you and me. And remember, Boaz is the son of who? Rahab the harlot. Rahab was a Canaanite, almost as hated in Israel as the Moabites. So just think about this for a second. The line of your Savior, Jesus Christ, the family he chose to come to and through. Boaz was part Canaanite, and now he took on a Moabite wife. See, God is telling us something here. The world may hate things and may hate people, but God will use those people who are disdained. God will use the lowest. He doesn't care. He only wants your availability. It's a beautiful thing. But listen to this. I want you to understand Morris. He talks about all of this in the genealogy and all of the mischief that went on in the genealogy of our Lord. And he says this about, and maybe you can relate. Christmas time, maybe it's a good reminder. You have some crazy family members. Yeah, amen? Don't say it if they're here with you visiting. Just, <laughs> I, didn't think, I didn't think ahead on that one. I apologize. But Morris says this. He says, God's hand is all over history. God works out his purpose generation after generation. Limited as we are to one lifetime, each of us sees so little of what happens. A genealogy is a striking way of bringing before us the continuity of God's purpose through the ages. The process of history is not haphazard. There is a purpose in it all, and the purpose is the purpose of God. We don't have to discuss your family tree, <laughs> and I won't even make any southern jokes. You know, sometimes people do that. I'm above that. But you know, when I read the genealogy of Jesus, I have hope. Because of all the people within that genealogy, the Lord chose this family. And I want to finish today with reading Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 16. Because just look at this. Look at the names in this genealogy. The book of, gene of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zahar by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Solomon. Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. But then look at this. David the king begot Solomon by her who he had been the wife of Uriah. We know the story. David murdered a man to take his wife, and they lost their first child, but then God raised up Solomon. You know, I don't know, this day and age, when you look around at all the families, the mixed families, and everything, and the divorce rate, and all the things that are going on, people think if they don't have some perfect family, they can't serve the Lord. It's not true. God can make the, me the mess of your life a beautiful message. Just give it to him. Verse 7, Solomon begot Rehoboam, Rehoboam begot Abijah, Abijah begot Asa, Asa begot Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begot Jerem, and Jerem begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham, and Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh, Manasseh begot Amon, and Amon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. The family of our Lord was taken into exile because of disobedience into Babylon. We just finished the book of Daniel a while back. We looked all into that exile in Babylon. But look at this, verse 12, it continues. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel begot Abiad, and Abiad begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azar. 
Azer begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, and Achim begot Eliud. Eliud begot Eleazar, and Eleazar begot Mathen, and Mathen begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now look at this, this last one, Joseph. He's not the biological father of Jesus, but under the laws of Israel, he was the adoptive father. And there's a whole story here I can't go into today, but just look at this. Joseph, what a beautiful way to end this beautiful genealogy of our Lord. And we know he came in the most humble of places, the city, the town of Ruth and Boaz, this place called Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And that is where the bread come down from heaven chose to be born. And so today as we celebrate Christmas and as we prepare our hearts for communion, just understand, just know, God is not done with you. God has a purpose and a plan for your life, no matter how messed up it might seem. No matter what you've been through, what your past looks like, no matter what you're struggling with today, just give it to the Lord. Give it to your king. He's willing to take it, and he's willing to take your life and make something special out of it. Just rest in him, lay at his feet, and seek him like never before. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Ruth and all the beautiful pictures and types. And Lord, help us to live it out. Help us to be those who long for your plan to come to fruition, Lord. And help us to be willing and able, Lord, like Boaz, to do our part. Lord, pour out your spirit upon your people. Bless us and help us, Lord, to live a life pleasing to you. As we celebrate this Christmas time, Lord, help us to be renewed. Help us to have a new birth within us, Lord. Provoke us to serve you in a way like never before and help us to have peace in our hearts. Help us to be satisfied in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you're visiting today, welcome. And just understand we do communion every week. We're also going to have a, a Christmas Eve celebration tonight, worship and food and fellowship, and we'll do communion again tonight. Um, and somebody said, why are you doing it twice? Well, it's because sometimes... People won't be here in the morning, they'll be here at night and vice versa, but also some of you need it twice, you know what I mean? <laughs> but here's the thing, communion is not to be taken lightly. The Bible says that we're not to take it in an unworthy manner. It's a time when we can reflect, when we can reset our lives, when we can get focused on the King of Kings, when we can take all that bitterness, all the things in our lives that we're holding on to, and we can just lay it at the feet of our Lord. And so right now, just get your heart ready for communion. The men will be up here with the elements. You'll come up, gather the elements, take them back, and hold on to them. We'll take them together. But I just want to say, if you're not a believer and you're here today, I, I say this every week, but communion is not for the non-believer, but it would be such an amazing and wonderful thing, such a celebration today as we worship our Lord in his birth, that you, as a new believer and in your first act of belief, could come and take part in communion with us and the family of God that you also could be grafted in to the family. And so if you would like to make that decision, come up and take communion, and then come pray with me after service. And so, Father, bless this time of communion. Bless any and all, Lord, who are here, who are, who are dealing with issues, who are maybe in a backslidden state or don't know you, Lord. Help them to make a decision to serve you and to love you and to become your own, to have a relationship with you, to lay at your feet and ask for your covering. Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.